So, dear students, dear colleagues, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this lecture on environmental subjectivities and post-human mythologies in Lara Cunha's poetry. In the context of the seminar, Meerjungfrauen, Klimakatastrophen und Posthumanismus im Werk von Laura Cunha at the Goethe Universität Frankfurt, a um, yeah, lecture will be held by Dr. Roberto Binetti from the University of Oxford. And I'm also pleased to say that this uh, lecture is a collaboration uh, between Goethe Universität uh, and the, the Italian Forum of Goethe Universität Frankfurt and the Frankfurter Stiftung für Deutsch-Italienische Studien. Roberto Binetti has studied classics and comparative literature, as well as modern philology at the University of Padua. He has then been a tutor and a lecturer for Italian studies at Bath University and at several university colleges in Oxford. In 2022, he earned his PhD from the University of Oxford with a thesis on voices from a minor literature reading the poetry of Elsa Morante, Amelia Rosselli, Patrizia Cavalli, and Bianca Maria Trabotta in context. Reading in context means that Vinati does not look at the selective corpus under the problematic label of female writing, but analyzes it against the background of its period of origin, which is Rome in the 1960s and 70s to learn attention to the historical and social cultural background and to the transnational literary canon as well. In line with his approach of examining the works of the four women authors, not as isolated phenomena, but as products of a specific social historical environment, Binetti also highlights the relationship of affiliation, but also of dialogue and mutual influence that developed between the poets. On the theoretical level, Binetti rejects an essentialist concept of scrittura femminile, women writing, and instead orients himself towards Deleuze Guattari's theory of literature mineure. Roberto Binetti has published several peer-reviewed articles or book chapters as, among others, Il Godimento e l'Oggetto Lunare, Per una lettura lacaniana di Gli Sguardi, I Fatti e Segnal, published in Ticon 3, Teoria, uh, Testo, Traduzione, in 2019. This article deals with a di dialogue between Zanzotto's poetry and Lacanian psychoanalysis. And this dialogue is also in the center of a monograph Dr. Vinetti is preparing on La domanda dell'inconscio, lingua e vita interiore nella poesia di Amelia Rostelli e Andrea Zanzotto. He has also published last year um, an article about Laura Pugno's poetry, um, Non appaio io, photographic lyricism and self-othering in Laura Pugno's Il Colore Oro. And finally, um, I would just mention um, the book chapter, Posthumous Self, Transnationalizing Italian Woman Self Elegy, where he examines two very recent volumes of poetry, Vita Meravigliosa uh, by Patrizia Cavalli and Nessuno Veda Nessuno by Bianca Maria. Trabotta. This chapter is part of the volume, The Contemporary Elegy in World Literature, edited by Adele Bardazzi, Roberto Binetti, and Jonathan Kaller, which is about to be published with Braille. I think now it, it will be yeah. issued uh, just in a few weeks. Right? Yeah. Um, he has also launched numerous initiatives to uh, research contemporary poetry, and in particular, with, together with Dr. Adele Bardazzi, he coordinates the project Non solo muse, panorama della poesia italiana dal 1970 oggi, funded by the John Field Fund and Oxford University Press. This project aims to reflect on the position of Italian women poets in contemporary literature and the critically interrogated 
category of female writers. Um, Roberto Binetti is also co-founder and coordinator of the research um, network Italian Poetry Today, and he has organized numerous workshops and uh, colloquia in this capacity. At present, Dr. Binetti's research is focusing on topics related to eco-criticism, always in relationship to contemporary poetry. And we are delighted to hear him talk today about, um, I just mentioned it, post-human mythologies in Laura Puno's poetry. Yeah, Roberto, thank you so much for be being here. I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Christine, for the kind invitation, but also for the uh, extremely kind attention that you devoted to my research and also the development of my research. Um, I I was so happy to, to hear also your, your very kind um, introduction, which point, point, pinpointed some of my uh, last publications, but also past uh, research at that directions. Um, and it's been very useful also because it's gonna help me to also situate uh, my lecture a little bit better. Um, so, for example, the focus of today's uh, lecture is going to be on Laura Puno's poetry and the uh, relationship between lyric poetry and posthumanism. How posthumanism could reinvent some specificity of the lyric discourse. Um, but is a kind of research, a lecture that started from my uh, doctoral thesis, my research on uh, women's writing in particular, and uh, especially on Deleuze, uh, who is going to, to be present as a sort of uh, stepping stone to analyze uh, posthumanism mythologies in Laura Puno's poetry. Um, in particular, not only the uh, definition of minor literature, but also the concept of becoming. And as you mentioned in my article, the uh, definition they give is that one of self-othering, becoming other than the self, which is a concept which is central to Gilles Deleuze's uh, Mille Plateaux, uh, but also his work on Kafka and minor literature. Uh, this is something that is going to be recurrent also in my analysis in, of Laura Pugno's uh, poetry today. So I'm going to start from a very brief introduction of the author, uh, Laura Pugno, who was born in Rome in 1970s and is a very active author and she has a far reaching uh, production. She published uh, at the intersection of various literary genres, not only novels such as Sirene, Mermaids, but also La Metà di Bosco, published in 2018, La Ragazza Selvaggia, published with Marsilio in 2020. She published several essays, among which In Territorio Selvaggio, Corpo, Romanzo, Comunità. This is not actually just an essay on uh, the um, novel, the Romanzo, but uh, is pretty fundamental, as, as we will see also for uh, Laura Pugno's reflection on poetry, uh, lyricism and lyric poetry, and how lyric poetry could be uh, put in uh, touch with uh, issues of uh, eco-criticism, for example, ecology and uh, cultural history. Uh, with Giulio Mozzi, she also published the Oracolo Manuale per Poeti e Poeti, uh, which was published with Sonzogno in 2020. And um, the, one of the most interesting aspects of Laura Pugno is that she's not only a novelist, she's not just an essayist, she's not just a poet, but she wrote several academic uh, pieces and essays, among which, for example, the Antologia, the anthology of contemporary poetry, Mappa Immaginaria della Poesia Italiana Contemporanea, contemporanea uh, in which she, is, she tries to define and reorganize uh, the uh, magma of contemporary Italian poetry through six different values uh, that she's going to identify among the poets uh, she decided to include in this anthology. 
So the attempt is also not only to, um, um, it's not just a creative production to a certain extent, but the attempt of, of Pugno is also to resonate, to, to reason on the um, basically structures of contemporary Italian poetry, trying to shape them also critically and to contribute on that uh, level. Uh, so she, it's uh, Laura Pugno, she's a pretty unique case, not only um, in Italian literature, but uh, I would say transnationally. Uh, today, we are going to focus mostly on Laura Pugno's poetry, uh, and specifically in the collection published in 27, uh, Il Colore Oro, The Color Golden. Uh, Laura Pugno's po um, poetry um, includes also Inomi, which is the last collection, collection which is forthcoming with La Nave di Tesio in May 2023. Uh, the last published collection is Annoy Us, published with Amos in 2020. Uh, Lalia, uh, which is the uh, second publication of a previously uh, published plaquette. Uh, Lamente Paisaggio, which was dedicated to the death of their mother and published uh, in 2010 with Perdone. Uh, Ilegni, published with Lieto Colle in 2018. Um, a, uh, this is a collection in which the um, ecological uh, task of the poet is pretty central. How the poet could uh, be uh, put in touch or closer with nature uh, from a different kind of perspective that doesn't uh, engage with a sort of romantic view of the poem immersed uh, in nature. Uh, she's not basically um, mocking Wordsworth or other romantic English poets, but she's trying to, to see, to test a different kind of connection with um, the natural landscape. And this is a very interesting collection as well. Uh, then Bianco White, which was published in, by, uh, with Not a Tempo in 2016. And finally, one of those collections, Il Colore Oro, published with the Lettere in 2007, which is going to be the main focus of this lecture. Uh, here I post a QR code if you uh, want access to the uh, text also in the English translations, uh, because I wasn't able to uh, showcase the um, Parity of the text in one uh, in just one slide. Uh, so if you want to go back to the text, you have also uh, these uh, possibility. Um, okay, I'm gonna start from the uh, thematical focus uh, of this lecture and also the aim and the objective of what I'm going to what I try I will try to to do today. Um, I'm going to use, uh, uh, as I've been using also in the title of this lecture, the definition of posthuman mythologies. Um, I didn't want to use posthuman subject uh, because it could be uh, considered a sort of uh, contradiction using the term posthuman subject. Uh, I was most I was more interested in testing and investigating. Laura Pugno tries to renovate the structure of the lyric subject uh, of uh, lyric poetry, as you will see, engaging also with the secular tradition, uh, which poses uh, the uh, basically the relationship and the dialogue between a present I and, a, and, a, and an absent uh, though. Um, She's engaging with that tradition, but she's trying to build up something uh, new, a myth uh, related to uh, the task of the writers, the responsibility of the writers uh, of engaging also with a contemporary society and issues uh, related to the representation of uh, the landscape and the environment. Um, so posthumanism comes through the crafting of a specific myth in Laura Pugno's poetry. That one of a new lyric subject, uh, which will define a sort of engaging with notion of posthumanism, and also through the innovation of a specific 
uh, characteristic of the lyric discourse, which is the apostrophe. The possibility of, again, of a single uh, subject, the I, uh, the poet in the text, uh, to engage with an absent though, uh, or uh, with the reader, for example. I use the word myth uh, because uh, this would allow not to uh, reduce Laura Punion's poetry to only to the recurrency of obsessive figures linked to repetition, anaphoras, and that kind of um, poetic details. Um, but on the fact that within Laura Punion's poetry, uh, there is a sort of reconcilable antinomy. How can we reconnect the um, lyric subject, the central speaking guy of lyric poetry, with an absent though? How can we reformulate these questions around this reconcilable antinomy? She is going to use a sort of myth, crafting a myth not only around his writing, but also around the uh, tradition of lyric poetry in general, but also specifically, as you will see, uh, with references to, for example, Amelia Rosselli, but also Eugenio Montale, specific references to the Italian um, literary uh, tradition. I say so, it's, it's important to uh, highlight a relationship with the Italian literary tradition because as a reader of Italian poetry, when I started reading, for example, um, uh, Laura Pugno's poetry, I wasn't able to fully grasp the um, references to the Italian lyric tradition. They seemed obscure. They seem sort of uh, implicated somehow in the text, uh, not completely suggested by, by the author, uh, but these, um, these particular characteristic, the uh, way of dissimulating the presence of, of Italian literary tradition and lyric tradition specifically, is central also to the creation of this uh, myth. We have also to define what is lyric poetry, which is, uh, I would say in Italian, it's an annosa questione. It's a very difficult and uh, very, uh, very old uh, question. Um, I, I will focus on the, uh, in order to try to define lyric poetry and how specifically Laura Pugnos tries to uh, renovate this um, discourse structure on the centrality of the lyric subject uh, in the Italian tradition, specifically, in which we have a fully recognized, uh, dating back to Dante and Petrarch, a central uh, I speaking subject, and then also the development that we witness, witnessed uh, specifically in the 20th century with the renovation of this uh, dynamic. Uh, within the use of pronoun high, we can witness, for example, the overlap, overlapping of a fictional and non-fictional character, but it expressed always through the use of the pronoun, pronoun I. I um, quoted a passage from uh, um, the very interesting introduction of the volume uh, Costruzione de Costruzioni del Io Lirico uh, nella poesia italiana da Sofici e Sanguinetti, which was edited by uh, Professor Christine Ott uh, a couple of years ago in 2015. Um, and I think that the key point uh, that uh, Christine Ott is raising in his introduction uh, is that the discourse on subjectivity, which always presupposes a unique and repeatable singular point of view, calls into question authenticity. Because here we insist on the true documented fact on the total coincidence of the lyric self and the empirical self. So we have this possible um, contradiction uh, trying to 
uh, in the Italian lyric tradition to um, overlap the fictional and the non-fictional. Uh, for example, Dante and Petrarch are helping us to do so uh, in trying to um, narrate uh, their relationship with the absent though from a sort of biographical point of view. Uh, there is something that happened before and after uh, the presence or the absence of Beatrice and Laura. Uh, so we have these in the Italian lyric tradition, uh, this sort of uh, strong um, suggestion from some of the classical poets. But then in the 20th century, there is uh, this problematization of the uh, relationship between fiction and fictional um, I. And one of the other uh, main characteristic of the lyric uh, discourse that we are going to uh, focus on today is going to be the um, apostrophe, uh, which is as defined by Jonathan Caller in Theory of the Lyric, the strategy of positing an addressee in a way uh, of securing particular effects. Um, so, for example, the use of the pronoun though, uh, to, uh, could be referred to um, an absent lover, uh, an object, a fading memory. Uh, and apostrophe is both direct and indirect for this reason, based etymologically on the notion of turning aside, of di digressing from straight speech. It manipulates the either structure of direct address in an indirect way. Also within this discursive structure, which is very peculiar of the um, lyric uh, discourse, we have what we can define the triangulated address. We don't have only the address, the in-text address to something absent, an object, nature, a, um, a dead lover, but also an intrinsic address to the reader to a certain extent, which is not directly and always implicated in the text. So we have the I though, but also we have the textual address, the object implicated, and also the extra textual address, the reader often, which is constantly uh, implicated. We are gonna see as uh, in Laura Pugno's poetry, for example, this um, triangle is going to be um, sort of uh, depending in particular on the presence of an extra textual address. When Laura Pugno tried to innovate uh, the structure of the apostrophe, she's going to try to channel a sort of ritualistic dialogue with the reader in a sort of uh, way of attempting uh, a new connection with the, um, with the reader, with the extra textual address. Sorry. Uh, so we already introduced the, uh, some of the key characteristics of, of the Italian uh, Lyric tradition with a particular reference to uh, some of the uh, cornerstones of the uh, Italian of Italian poetry, such as Petra's Canzoniere and uh, Dante's Vita Nova, which helped to shape also transnationally the idea of what lyric poetry is. Uh, try to think, for example, at the um, transcultural and transnational reception of Petrarchism in the Renaissance, and uh, also not, uh, again, limited to the Italian context. And I've tried to pinpoint, pinpoint also by simplifying them, some of the key characteristics of the uh, Italian lyric tradition. Usually we have a woman uh, as distant or absent that object, which is a sort of projection of the male subject's desire. Uh, in most cases, she's not speaking, 
she's completely absent and removed from the discourse. She's silenced and dispossessed. And also she's uh, compared to uh, natural elements. We can identify this module again on Petrarch, uh, the canzone Chiare Fresche Dolci Acque, uh, spanning towards, for example, Manzoni, the chorus of the Adelchi, Sparse le trecce morbide sulla fannoso petto, uh, and there is this constant um, reappraisal of the female figure through the natural elements. We have a sort of body in parts, uh, which is described only through details and through minor uh, beats and chunks of the body. Uh, le trecce, the hair, uh, but also the, um, the glands. There is just, we don't get usually a full description of the um, distant and absent woman. Okay, uh, what I wanted to highlight also specifically in the um, uh, Italian lyric tradition, especially with reference to the 20th century, is, uh, and also with the help of uh, an anthology published by uh, Enrico Testa, which is called Dopo la Lirica, after uh, the uh, end of the lyric genre, which uh, Tesca, Tesca identifies in the 60s, and in particular, thanks to the experiments of several uh, Italian poets, such as Amelia Rosselli, with uh, Variazioni Belli, who were variations, uh, Mario Luzzi's Nel Magma, but also Vittorio Sereni, uh, Gli Stumenti Umani, and also many others, Caproni's Il Passaggio di, di Enea, etc., etc. Um, Enrico Testa, specifically in Dopo la Lirica, argues that from the 60s onwards, also thanks to the Neo Vanguardia, the um, new experimentalism in uh, Italian poetry, we can witness a sort of dimension that transcends the uh, unifying element uh, of the Ivo relationship, the solipsism of the lyric subject. Uh, apostrophe gets more complicated uh, during the 60s. And sometimes, specifically, we can find a chorus of voices, but also this sort of horizontal connection with uh, others, uh, no longer just one uh, addressee, uh, but uh, sometimes even a crowd, of uh, unnamed people, for example, such as in Sereni, Gli Sumenti Umani, uh, there is this beautiful text, uh, La Spiaggia, in which there is this unidentifiable crowd of silenced uh, addressees. But also there is a tendency from switching from singularity to plurality, uh, not only as regards to the um, lyric subject, but also to the addressees. I try to exemplify this movement, uh, picking up two um, texts that are closely uh, related. One which is, uh, to an extent, classical from Petrarch, uh, and is taken from the Canzoniere. And the other one, uh, and the second one, um, written by Amelia Rosselli and published in 1966. Uh, what I was interested in showing um, was the uh, use of the apostrophe and the discursive relationship that is established between the lyric subject and the absent object. Uh, in the first case, the object is necessary, as Petrarch shows. In Amelia Rosselli, what is extremely modern uh, is the removal of this necessity. Okay, I will read it briefly. 
Per voi convenio chi arda e in voi respire, chi pur fui vostro, e se di voi son privo, vi amendo ogni sventura altra mi dole. Di speranza mi impieste e di desire, quando io partì dal sommo piacer vivo, ma il vento ne portava le parole. For you I shall burn and breathe in you, for I was yours, and I am bereft of you. I grieve less than any other misfortune. So even the expression of feeling is determined by the object. The object is creating, is nece nece necessary to create and to express the feeling, but also to create the occasion, the chance to write poetry. On the other hand, in the Rosselli's text, we can read. Io non so se tra il sorriso della verde estate e la tua verde differenza vi sia una differenza. Io non so se io rimo per incanto o per travagliata pena. Io non so se rimo interamente per te. She's making pretty clear that she doesn't know uh, if I rhyme, if I write uh, poetry entirely due to the absence of a second person, uh, uh, a distant lover, uh, beloved ones who is not present, or if poetry is actually this incanto, this enchantment, which is happening, as is being reenacted within the lyric discourse. So she's engaging to a certain extent with uh, the text where they quoted by Petrarch, uh, but in La Libella, this uh, collection published in 1966, uh, also with the work of Dante specifically, trying to keep the structure of the I though, because it's still present, okay, uh, I don't know if I rhyme by enchantment or by torment. I don't know if I rhyme entirely for you. She's pretty clear about the presence uh, of the absent object. Uh, but again, she uh, tries to renovate the, um, the uh, structure of the apostrophe and also to problematize it. As suggested by Santini and Summerfield in the introduction of the politics of poetics, lyric poetry is often viewed as a means of introspection or at best as an instru instrument of self-representation. Uh, as we read in the text by Petrarch, the absence of Laura is the thing that allowed the poets to, to, to write, basically. This widespread conception marginalizes when it does not completely exclude all those work in which writing results from a desire to undergo an experience with language. This is central, for example, in the enchantment, in the incanto, uh, as an experience within language, in the text that we read by Rosselli. But also we'll see uh, this will be central also in the text by Pugnos that we're going to read today. It's a matter of uh, evolution of the uh, way we um, interpret art in general, but also in particular uh, lyric poetry. Uh, we uh, started from a sort of solipsistic view of the lyric subject, uh, which needs a uh, sort of absence to reiterate his desire, his lyric discourse. But uh, what is interesting and what is pretty central in Rosselli is this incanto of relationality. There is still there an absent someone or something, but the focus of Rosselli, but also of Pugnos, we'll see, will be on relationality, including a set of artistic practices or uh, discourses, which take as the theoretical and practical point of departure the whole of human relations and the social context, rather than an independent and private space. This is something that Rosselli, specifically in La Libella, was, to, was trying to say uh, through this 
undergoing of an experience within language, but we will see a central also in Laura Pugno's poetry. So to go back to Laura Pugno's finally, and to, uh, um, to focus specifically on Il Colore Oro, what happens in this collection? We still have a centrality, not of the subject, but of the body. A body that we will see will be characterized by a sort of post-human uh, mythologies. Uh, there are going to be still details, for example. We don't get a full description of the body because the body described by Laura Pugno in uh, Il Colore Oro is a body constantly uh, mutating, assuming different forms, uh, becoming a mermaid frequently, uh, becoming something which is uh, indistinguishable uh, between sort of prothesis, uh, non-human objects, nature sometimes, uh, it is a subject that uh, metonymically tends to occupy a space, to become one uh, with the space is occupying. Uh, there is going to be this beautiful metaphor regarding uh, becoming the um, content of the jar she's staring at in that moment. Um, what is very central is also this idea of expanded subjectivity, of occupying a space, of becoming um, other in this process, which is central not only to any definition of uh, post-humanism, let's try to think, for example, of Daidotti, but also to go back to Gilles Deleuze's notion of uh, devenir tout le monde, which is uh, central, according to Deleuze, to uh, the experience of women's writing, becoming women, women within the act of writing. What is also central is uh, the um, importance of the uh, actions uh, that are described in Laura Pugno's poetry. Uh, the repetition also of those actions in order to create um, a sort of ritual and to disentangle the uh, subject that here is described from the notion of uh, the classic apostrophe. And what it's interesting is like this ability to craft a new narrative uh, structure, uh, which is already present, for example, also in Laura Pugno's novel, uh, Sirene, that deconstruct the centrality of the subject in the lyric discourse. The subject is no longer opposed to the other. The other is no longer necessary to define the subject, but is defined through the interaction with several elements that surround it. For example, we see the sirene again. The sirene at a certain point, the mermaids tend to become and to be englobated within the lyric subject, uh, but also several objects uh, or, uh, again, some natural spaces, such as the desert or the city. What is pretty central, and I think that uh, Rosie Braidotti uh, says it beautifully in uh, uh, essay, The Post-Human, is about this object uh, dealing with the notion of um, humanism. These are the sexualized, racialized, and naturalized others who are reduced to less than human status of disposable bodies. We are all humans, but some of us are just more mortal than others. The attempt of Pugno, as described by Rosi Braidottis in the uh, Post-Human, is to create a sort of anti-humanism through the lyric discourse. Okay, we no longer had the centrality of the lyric subject, who is determined from 
or thanks to the interaction with the others. The others are not necessary. What is necessary is to reach out, to englobate, to connect with the others within this um, discursive structure, to become other, not to have the necessity to have the other to determine myself. And this anti-humanism consists in delinking the human agent from this universalistic posture, a universalistic posture which is pretty central to the structure of the lyric subject. Different and sharper power relations emerge once this formerly dominant subject is freed from his delusions of grandeur and is no longer allegedly in charge of historical progress. Uh, we will notice a sort of um, poetry in, in Puno's Ecoleolo, in which the time seems uh, delinked and suspended. Uh, to a certain ex extent, there is just representation, but there is no history in Ecoleolo. Um, and Braidotti says also another thing in this subject, which is pretty central to understand how Pugno, uh, our intent Pugno um, posthuman mythology. As a brand of vital materialism, posthuman theory contests the arrogance of anthropocentrism and the ex exceptionalism of the human as a transcendental category. It strikes instead an alliance with the productive and immanence force of Zoe, of life in its non-human aspects. This requires a mutation of our shared understanding of what it means to think at all, let alone think critically. And Pugno in a poetry is using the most traditional uh, characteristic of the um, lyric discourse of lyric poetry the lyric subject and the apostrophe, okay, to basically contest this anthropocentric viewpoint, the centrality of the human speaking, usually a male referring to a woman. She's debunking to a certain extent this notion, uh, this ground characterizing lyric poetry and she's moving towards another uh, another discursive structure. By posthuman mythology, the thought I mean the crafting of a voluntarily marked and mutated body. Uh, it's still difficult to define it as a sort of new lyric subject. For this reason, it's better, I think, to use, to use mythology. There is this narrative that Spugno exposes in uh, her poetry, which is born from the encounter between flesh and metal, skin and ink, whose substance consciously embraces difference through the will to be other, to in this act constantly of self-othering, but not to define themselves through the others. This is the key point. The you is no longer necessary, is necessary the act of embracing the other and the difference also through nature, through the interaction with human and non-human object. This is the uh, cover, the front cover of Il Colore Olo, which is, um, I, fo I forgot to mention, is a collaborative um, art project also, uh, uh, which includes not only the photographs by so not only the poetry by Laura Pugno, but also the photographs by uh, Elio Mazzacane, uh, with whom she collaborated on, um, on several other projects. Um, this is the first text I wanted to, to read with you in order to uh, verify the uh, creation uh, of this posthuman mythology. Uh, this is the, one of the most beautiful texts, I think, in Ecoleodo, and is the text that opens the second section of the uh, collection, which is uh, titled Ecoleodo. Um, and the uh, mythology created here uh, starts with the metaphor. 
with a definition of what poetry is. This is a notebook for hunting with the hawks. Questo è un quaderno per cacciare con il falco. Um, this is a recurring metaphor that we will see engages with a very long uh, lyric tradition uh, that spans from the Middle Ages, the troubadour lyric poetry, until Montale, for example, or Caproni in the uh, Conte of uh, Kevin Hüller. Um, but it's interesting how creating this posthuman myth around who is speaking in this poem, Cugno is trying to both relate and to engage with tradition, but to deeply innovate and renovate it from within. I'm going to read it briefly. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to include all the text in one slide, but then I will go back also to the English translation. Um, questo è un quaderno per cacciare con il falco. La ragazza beve latte assenzio, solo nell'ora del sole più caldo diventerà sirena. Corpo tiepido in acqua misto ad alghe, traccia sensibile all'avvicinamento, sta davanti al tuo corpo. Dentro di te si muove grano come mare. Interrogheranno i girasoli, le viscere, le api, ha un sapore di uso, di plastica al sole. Il terreno è sensibile al tuo peso, si modifica come uno schermo, scorreranno viste della città d'oro. La città temporanea del tempo che ti abita, sai la posizione esatta della nuca e dalle spalle ai calcagni, a ogni tuo passo, questo che sei nel centro, rilegalo, collacci, tocchi i talloni, la pelle delle braccia dove trema, hai freddo e vai avanti. Corpo più profondo e sconosciuto, riscrivi le tue leggi, non sei più acqua mista mare, sei che brucia sostanze e continua bruciando. Questo è un quaderno per cacciare col falco, scrivi le prede. Questo è un libro, oppure il bosco diventerà un diverso bosco. Il tuo corpo è un profumo fatto di un guento. What I think, um, apart from the very, um, very interesting metaphorical chain uh, and also the chain of symbols uh, that are showcased in, in this poem, is the presence of the body, uh, which is constantly mutating by the engagement with nature and with human and non-human um, objects. And what is interesting, and, and I try to highlight it here, is the presence of the corpo with non, non sei più. You are no longer the kind of body that you were at the start uh, of the, um, of the uh, poem. Traccia sensibile all'avvicinamento, sta davanti al tuo corpo. A trace sensitive to be approached stands before your body. Uh, what is interesting is like also this vision uh, of the body of this posthuman, uh, let's call it subject, um, from outside. And then through the movement of uh, basically evolution, uh, there is the description of a new uh, body, what is going to become a mermaid, una ragazza che beve latte e assenzio, sono nell'ora del sole più caldo, diventerà serena. It's also interesting the use of the uh, tenses, the verb tenses in this poem. So, for example, there is this use of the future, uh, which is very uh, interesting in the first half of the poem. Diventerà, interrogeranno i girasoli, le viscere, le api. Also with the crafting of this environment around the, uh, this evolving subject. Okay? Le api, the bees flowers, plastic in the sun, the uso, etc., etc. And there is, in the second half of the poem, the uh, description of the body that has to be restitched to a certain extent. 
questo che sei nel centro, rilegalo, con lacci, tocca i talloni, la pelle delle braccia dove trema. Hai freddo e vai avanti. Seems like a sort of description, a sort of newly born Frankenstein by, by Mary Shelley, but with a mermaid uh, sort of undertone. Um, and it's interesting how this body uh, remembered the details that we described from the Petrarch's, uh, when we read the Petrarch's um, sonnet uh, on Laura. The absent object is only possible to be uh, to be investigated, uh, to be described only through uh, details. Okay, it's interesting how here details, body parts, for example, are restitched together uh, in a new costume and form. This that you are in the center, we read it it with laces, touch your heels, the skin of your arms, where it trembles. You are cold and go forward. There is a description of a sort of new anthropology, a posthuman anthropology of how the lyric subject is trying, this subject, this posthuman subject, is trying to uh, basically um, enter the world. Okay, and what I uh, found particularly interesting in this text uh, are the last bits. Uh, questo è un quaderno per cacciare col falco, scrivi le prede. Questo è un libro, oppure il bosco diventa un diverso bosco. Il tuo corpo è un profumo fatto di unguento. It's interesting because here we have a direct apostrophe to what has been created in the first half of the poem. Scrivi, write down your prey, scrivi, uh, write down the names of your prey. But also it's interesting to see how it's a sort of invite to the reader. Okay. Uh, we have a reference not only to in the in-text address, but also to the extra textual address in this case. And then we have the definition, the key to understand the uh, metaphorical chain. Questo è un libro, oppure il bosco diventa un diverso bosco. Okay. And um, sorry, I'm going to stop the phone because it's ringing. And um, the last bit of the poem is particularly important because um, uh, we have the key to interpret the old poem. Uh, this is not a book, of, it's no longer a book of poetry. It has been evolving because we don't have uh, any longer the necessity of having a, um, an absent object to create poetry. But we can create poetry with a newly formed posthuman body and me. Um, what I found particularly interesting is the uh, reference to hunting, uh, which I was saying is very ancient and old and dates back also to another interest uh, um, by Pugno, uh, which is Troubadour uh, poetry. Uh, and in particular, this book that she um, recently published in, 20, um, uh, in 2022, which is an anthology of uh, Troubadour lyric poetry. Uh, that she uh, basically she selected a series of uh, authors and she translated them. Uh, it's interesting to see how this troubadour tradition is already present in 27 in her poetry. Um, I attach here the um, reference to a poem that she translated and which is included in this volume uh, by the troubadour Uc de Saint Cirque. Uh, in which this is actually uh, Pugno's translation. 
he says, da voi sono andato via, ma il fuoco varda. E amo un'altra più di quanto v'abbia amata mai, che non è lontana da me più di un tiro d'arco, e di quelle come voi vale una valle intera. For me I went away, il fire burns you, and I love another more than I ever loved you. Who is not farther from me than a bow shot, and of such as you is worth a whole. Um, and specifically, uh, it's interesting to see how is in Trubadur lyric poetry the um, metaphor uh, regarding the uh, hunting from distance is very frequent. Uh, Usually, uh, for example, uh, at least in Trovador poetry, we don't have many references to the hawks, uh, um, which are used in order to, to hunt. It's interesting to see how Laura Pugno uses these uh, references to uh, define how poetry works for her in Il Colore Oro. Uh, poetry works as a notebook to give direction. So we have a filter between the actual act of hunting and the object to give instruction to reach a prey, the other, okay? But with something else through the filter of a natural element, the hawk, okay? Um, and it's interesting how uh, these, um, Metaphor is for sure present, and uh, Pugno knows well uh, the uh, Tobadur lyric poetry. Uh, another reference that uh, I was thinking at is Eugenio Montale's uh, Il Quaderno di Quattro Anni, uh, in which there is the description of, again, an absent uh, lover, a dead lover, Annetta Arletta. Uh, described through the use of a metaphor involving a bird, a black cap. La capinera non fu uccisa da un cacciatore che io sappia. Morì forse nel mezzo del mattino e non nebbi mai notizia. Suppongo che di me abbia perduto anche il ricordo. Se ora qualche fantasma leggia qui d'attorno, non posso catturarlo per chiedergli chi sei. Again, Extremely interesting. This is uh, one of the latest poems by Montale, but it's interesting to see also the uh, metapoetic reflection on the use of the apostrophe, for example. Uh, it starts uh, from a sort of narrative, uh, narration and the enucleation of a sort of metaphor. Uh, so uh, the uh, absent uh, and that lover uh, is described as a sort of um, capinera, uh, black cap. But the thing that he's trying to um, investigate in this uh, particular poem, Montale, is the fact that we don't know who killed the uh, bird. Uh, it was not the fault of the poet, the hunter, uh, to uh, impose the necessity of the absent uh, other in uh, uh, his lyric poetry. But then there is a further turn in the last three lines uh, in which the black cap, this kind of the description of the hunt, is functional to address this absent reader. There is this sort of circuit between the first description of the lost object as a bird, and then the sort of division between the identity of the bird, which was just a metaphor, and then the actual addressee in this poem. Non posso catturarlo per chiedergli chi sei. I can't catch her to ask who you are. And this is, again, pretty central, and I think, was one of the references in, present in Laura Pugno's poem. As Adele Bardazzi states in uh, 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 monograph Eugenio Montale, 
Politics of Mourning, this particular text by uh, Montale can be read as sort of metapoetic, apologetic gesture on the part, the poetic subject in relation to the necessary act, so common in lyric poetry, of making the lost object of love irrevocably absent in order to mourn and death and thus give life to the poetic subject server. Uh, in any case, Arletta had to be killed or other sacrificed was already known. Um, and this is something that also Laura Pugnos in Il Colore Oro, uh, and in particular in Questo Un Quaderno per Cacciare con il Falco, tries to problematize. And it does so through the use of a natural element uh, involved in the hunting, the hawk, but also with the metaphor, ongoing metaphor between writing and hunting. Uh, and this gives her the tools to basically rework some of the key structure um, of the lyric genre through a sort of post-humanist and anti-humanist uh, point of view. Um, I wanted to focus also on a text that is closely even more related to uh, uh, Laura Pugno's uh, novel Sirene, in which we have the description of this dystopic uh, world in which some of the uh, subjugated protagonists, these uh, that we can compare to the absent uh, object of lyric poetry, are these figures, these posthuman figures of the mermaids. Uh, and it's particularly interesting to see how the uh, description of the Serena the mermaids uh, correspond and overlap with uh, some of the um, verses, the lines that we find in Il Colore Oro. Le femmine erano bestie da latte e da carne, e insieme erano donne, prive di parola, prive di gambe, il muscolo unico, del, muscolo unico della coda, capace di spezzare in due la schiena di che un uomo, la vagina liscia, protetta dall'abrasione dell'acqua di mare, da uno smegma madre per laccio, priva di peli. What is interesting is, again, the description of the body through particular details, which is something that we can find also uh, in um, La Rapugna's poetry, but also the reflection, and this is the key uh, element of this passage, of the, uh, these objects as speechless, who are unable to, to be heard. Uh, in the mythical imaginary, we have this view of these sirens, the, the mermaids, who are singing and trying to approach, um, basically, the, the listener to, to convince uh, Ulysses uh, to listen to the um, to the songs. Uh, it's interesting to see how here uh, mermaids are speechless, basically, and it's something that uh, we found also in Questo un quaderno per cacciare con il falco, but that we can find also in one of the central poems by Laura Pugno in uh, Il colore d'oro which is entitled Lady Marmalade. Metti nell'acqua del tè un po' di polvere d'oro. Tocca lentamente con le labbra l'orlo caldo del bicchiere, sei a casa tu dai molti nomi. Hanno lasciato gli avanzi pane e uova. Per loro hai rubato uova e arance, hanno, si dice, occhi d'oro. Mangia questa marmellata d'arancia a mare, c'è il tuo corpo nel barattolo di vetro. Se le belle sirene ci divoreranno, se le belle bestie disumane, non sei tu che ascolta queste voci, non sei tu che, gioca con, che giochi con noi, dea d'oro, ragazza marmellata, perché già ti ha visto la sirena quando hai messo fuori la scodella con gli spaghetti e l'uovo. Già ti ha divorato, sei già nuovo. This is a text that I wasn't able to, to fully uh, translate it, but uh, the very first section, the last section, gives us a sort of key to understand the old volume and also the creation of this new posthuman myth. Again, we start with um, 
a sort of description of actions, the ritual around this uh, uh, addressee. Metti l'acqua nel tè, tocca lentamente, put the tea, um, put the water in the tea, uh, start to slowly touch with your lips. And then the, finally, the apostrophe, uh, sei a casa, tu dei molti nomi. In this case, the pronoun, you of many names, are sort of repolished from all his uh, significance. We cannot identify an address within this you, this two, the second person uh, singular pronoun, but we can understand many names. Uh, so we no longer have a sort of um, address in mind, such as Laura, such as Arletta, such as Beatrice, uh, such as Rocco Scotellaro in the case of Amelia Rosselli. But we have a U of many names, which is given leftovers, avanzi, pane uova. Uh, so is given what is, has been left over from you can consider sort of meta engaging also with the tradition uh, is given the rest. It's no longer possible to write a poem with, according to a pugno, with a specific addressee in mind. And then also interesting in this first bit, um, the, uh, how the ritual create a sort of expanded subjectivity a body that tends to coincide with the glass jar of the marmalade that is, uh, they are eating. Uh, it is marmalade of bitter oranges, there's your body in the glass jar. Uh, again, what we were trying to define as occupying a space, this body, this posthuman myth is trying to occupy a space uh, rather than be uh, to 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 self uh, to to define himself through the interaction with the other, and then again the um, description of the mermaids, and these um, sort of overlapping between the object described, le belle sirene. Okay, le belle bestie disumane, these beautiful inhuman beasts, and the two. But here there is also the specification by Pugno, non sei tu quella che ascolta queste voci. It is not you who hears, who listens to these voices. It is not you who plays with us. Okay, the figure of the mermaids, these posthuman um, posthuman myth help helps Pugno to basically have an occasion to basically investigate to the absence, the impossibility of having an apostrophic U uh, in, in poetry. And uh, there is this sort of final uh, act of devouring, uh, devouring the um, the you, uh, not only on a symbolic way, but also on a pronominal and grammatical level. It is interesting to see also how Pugno, uh, both in the novel, as we see with the description of mermaids, but also in poetry, focuses a lot on. Uh, images uh, but uh, what is was interesting to to hear also when we when i had the chance to interview her for the project non solo muse uh, was to um to to understand how she highlights the centrality of the poetic word in her production so we don't have uh these um basically images these little details but also we have, it because we are uh, bombarded by images every day, but poetry and writing in general is for Pugno a chance to 
give attention to the poetic word, the word standing alone on a page. Uh, and this is the first visualization uh, that she uh, describes in her creative process. As she says, today as never before, writing has been confronting with the image. But in my opinion, this is no way affects the position of strength of the word, its field of total possibility. Not of force relative to the image of absolute force. Each field is absolute and at the same time interlaced with the others. Again, it's interesting to see how even in the description of her creative process, there is this element of connection and that self-othering. Again, it's not a you, but it's a plural, though, to a certain extent. This seems to me the only starting point that still makes it possible to write about poetry today, to keep in mind its physical impact on bodies and the world. And we had a uh, scene like uh, the centrality of the body, a sort of dismembered body that has to be restitched and put in communication with what is posthuman, a sort of Frankenstein mermaid is the only way to rework and to create uh, poetry. Okay, I'm going to focus on the last uh, on the last text briefly, also because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, il tuo corpo il sole. Non è la stessa lingua che parli se il tuo corpo è il sole. Viene perimetrato sempre lo stesso terreno, pochi metri di ghiaccio con oasi, una stoffa arancio, inteso su un tappeto. Una lingua verrà inventata. Oppure un asciugamano rosso, cupo, che ti copre la testa. Questa è la metratura del deserto. Di notte, i segni di percorrere il territorio al buio, con una benda azzurra intorno ai polsi, e sale azzurro sulla bocca e sulla schiena. Uh, this, this text in particular uh, was interesting to determine not just the presence of uh, the mermaid, uh, this posthuman uh, object to renovate from within the body, the corpo, this posthuman myth and of the lyric subject, but also to see how this notion of expanded subjectivity uh, is, has to be put in touch also with uh, the environment. Uh, there is always the attempt in Avalapugno uh, from this body to occupy a space and to become uh, one with the uh, natural landscape. Se il tuo corpo è il sole, so there is also the uh, interrogation about the uh, overlapping between this body and the natural element, the sun, uh, but also the necessity of reinventing a new lyric language. Una lingua verrà inventata, oppure, again, the description of another action, a ritual, un asciugamano rosso, cupo, che ti copre la testa. Questa è la metratura del deserto. This is not only the square footage of the desert, but is, to a certain extent, the square footage of the lyric subject. Very, very briefly, the last quote from In Il Territorio Selvaggio, uh, which is uh, Pugno's essay on uh, the novel, but the, the, we have also some hints on how a creative process works, and in particular how this idea of a posthuman subject is present and central also to her poetry. Uh, più il mondo esterno diventa in apparenza governabile, più il corpo si rivela come il ridotto irremedibile del selvaggio. Ciò che ci sfugge, ciò che non riusciamo a controllare, anche se sappiamo che controllo, non è la parola, la cosa che dovremmo fare. Vorremmo essere, anzi diventare corpo-mente, tutt'uno con una sapienza che immaginiamo sfuggirci. It's pretty central. We would like to be indeed become body mind at one with a wisdom that we imagine eludes us. Why is it central? Because it's describing basically humanism. Okay. And is describing a very humanistic uh, process, which is central and is the foreground also the lyric discourse. The necessity of 
being defined through the other and thanks to the other, thanks to the expression of interiority, for example, of a feeling, and basically trying to demonstrate this correlation between body and mind. But she's suggesting something different, the necessity of this post-human connection with the other, being the removed part of ourselves, being nature, uh, being the uncharted territory, territory of um, basically uh, evolution into something else of possibility. And poetry is helping to craft this particular reflection of Pugno. Uh, I'll stop here. Uh, I have other slides regarding other bits and parts of Pugno, but I know that I've been a little bit longer. So uh, thank you so much again for this possibility. And I would be glad also to uh, to answer any question you may you may have.